Ever wondered how to get Docker images to run nicely with XUnit tests? Then this is the right video for you. Let me show you how to set up local stack with XUnit properly so that the only thing you need to worry about is having Docker running. We will first set up the base infrastructure using two or lesser known XUnit features before doing container management using test containers. The first feature of XUnit that we're going to take a look at is lifecycle management with iAsync lifetime. We're going to use this to create an instance of a local stack container later on, but we first need to set up a class initially so that we can use it with our second XUnit feature. When we add the iAsync lifetime interface to a class, we tell XUnit that we need to start and dispose of this implementation in an asynchronous manner. This means we need to implement two different methods, initialize async and dispose async. The next feature of XUnit that we're going to use is collection fixtures. This allows us to have a singleton instance of our object for all tests, unlike a class fixture. A class fixture will only allow us to have a singleton instance for any test class that inherits from a class fixture. The reason I'm opting to use a collection fixture is so that we reduce the number of instances of local stack because it can be quite heavy to run. If you think you can get away with a regular class fixture for your project, you can definitely do that. A collection fixture needs three different parts. We need to create a class for the collection definition. We need to add an attribute to our test class pointing to that collection definition before finally injecting the class instance into the test class itself. So let's take a look at creating a class for our collection definition. This is going to be an empty or marker class because XUnit needs this for discovery purposes. We first need to inherit from I collection fixture of T where T is a type that you want a singleton of and that will be injected to our test class. Next, we need to add a class level attribute called collection definition, which requires us to supply a name. I'm just going to use name of T to point back to the class that we created. So let's move back to our test class. I've already pre-populated this with a couple of random tests, which will ensure everything is working later on. To make use of the collection definition, we're going to need to add a class level attribute to our test class called collection. This takes a single parameter, for this collection attribute, we need to pass in the same name that we gave to the collection definition attribute earlier. So here, we're just going to use the same name of expression so that everything lines up nicely for us. The last bit is to create a new constructor and add a parameter for our type T, which for us is going to be our local stack container. So at this point, we have XUnit all configured to use a single instance of our container class and that container class has an asynchronous lifetime for us. So now let's look at how we would set up local stack. If you haven't heard of test containers before, you should go and check the project out. A link for this is in the description below. We're going to use test containers to spin up a new instance of local stack in our tests using the container class that we created earlier. First of all, let's create two properties, one for the local stack port that we're going to use and the next for a generated URL using the new port number just to make our lives a little bit easier later on. Then we need to create a private field to hold our container instance so we can manipulate it from initialize and dispose. So let's set up the container instance in the constructor. We need to create a new instance of test containers builder with the type test containers container from which we can configure this container. We need to call a few different methods on this instance. The first is with image. This tells us which Docker image to use. With cleanup tells test containers to clean up the image when we're done with it. With port binding, map supports for us. It's important that we use the generated port number here, mapping back to the consistent local stack port 4566. Once we've called these methods, we can call build on the container definition, and then we can go and manipulate it inside of our lifecycle events. In the initialize async method, we first need to create a new cancellation token source so we can abort any slow startups should we need to. Then we call start async on the container instance we set up earlier, remembering to pass in the cancellation token. Inside of the dispose async method, we just need to call dispose async on the test containers instance. With this now done, we're in a suitable point where we can test the entire flow and watch our docking container spin up and tear down without any other effort than clicking run on the tests. So now that we have a container up and running, we want the ability to seed it with something useful, such as data for DynamoDB. In order to do this, we do need to make a few changes to our container configuration. First, we're gonna create a couple of directories where we're gonna hold our initialization data. 
The first directory is called aws-c-data. This will hold an initialization script that we will use to ensure the ordering of our scripts. That script will call into our second directory, which we're going to call scripts. This is where the bulk of your scripts are going to go. It's important to know that any SH scripts that you create must have the line feed setting. So under the AWS C data folder, we first need to create an init.sh script. Inside of this script, we're just going to have a simple line that says forward slash scripts forward slash dynamodb.sh. Note that the forward slash is very important as we will bind this later on. In the scripts subdirectory, let's create a new script called dynamodb.sh. In here, we're going to create a new DynamoDB table using the AWS local command. This command is essentially a fully fledged AWS CLI, but you never have to set the endpoint, which makes it super handy for scripting. In my example here, I'm just creating a Dynamo table as I would do normally. I'm just switching out AWS for AWS local. Although I'm not doing it here, you can do a lot of other fancy things like preceding data or the DynamoDB table. Now that we have our scripts set up, let's head back to the local stack container instance where we need to adjust the setup to mount our seeding files. To do this, we're going to need the full path on our host machine where we're going to want to mount from and the corresponding destination inside the Docker image. Local stack has a special folder inside the image which is scanned to look for scripts at different parts of the initialization process. This folder is forward slash etc forward slash local stack forward slash init and it contains four different directories boot.d which runs when the container is running start.d is when the python process is running ready.d is when the local stack is ready to serve requests and finally shutdown.d which is when local stack is shutting down for our scripts to work we need to make sure that local stack is actually ready so we're going to mount the folder containing our init.sh script to the directory ready.d. This means our init script will be called as soon as local stack is ready for it to be executed. To do this, we're going to call with bind mount on the container image, passing in our folder followed by the folder that we want to mount to inside of the Docker image. Because our init script calls out to a different directory, we're also going to need to map our scripts directory. So again, we need to call with bind mount and map our scripts directory to forward slash scripts. All of our scripts are now ready to run inside of the instance, but we do have a slight ordering problem. Our tests may be executed before our local stack instance has been fully provisioned. Lucky for us, we have a couple of features inside of test containers and local stack that have this scenario covered. Local stack has an endpoint to check the status of the initialization. This is located on the HTTP endpoint underscore local stack forward slash init. Test containers allow us to provide our own wait strategy too. So we can use both of these two features combined to create a new wait check implementation inside of test containers. So let's create a new class and make it implement the I wait until interface. In the constructor of the wait check, we need to take a single parameter, which is going to be the endpoint of local stack. We then need to complete the until method we will use the until method to make a call out to the API. We don't need to worry about retry strategies here. We just need to return a true or false from this method. And test containers will continually call this on a regular interval until it succeeds. The structure of the JSON returned from the local stack in the endpoint as a completed object, which has keys for each of the initialization phases. It also has a script section, which contains a list of scripts for each stage and their corresponding states. So we just need to check the script sections and look for the init.sh script inside the ready stage and ensure that it has the state OK. This means our init script has run to completion. The last bit for us to do is to configure the wait strategy for the container. Back to our container definition, we need to call a method called with wait strategy. This takes one or more wait strategies, which are built using the wait class. The first thing we need to do on this wait class is to tell test containers that we're going to be waiting for a Linux container. We do this by calling wait dot for Unix container. And then we can call two additional methods. 
The first is until port is available, which will check the Linux container to ensure that a port is being listened on. This will always need to be the port inside of the container that's being listened to, not the port that we're going to be calling on. So in our case, it is always going to be local stacks port of 4566. Next, we add add custom wait strategy. And in here, we just pass in a new instance of our wait strategy, passing in the local stack URL. With all of these steps completed, you should now have tests that are nice and repeatable using XUnit and local stack. You can also repeat the same methodology for things like MySQL. If you're wondering what else you might be missing out on, then check out some of the latest .NET 7 features that you may have missed.